This podcast episode was made possible by our generous Patreon supporters. A special mention goes to Amy Austin, Matt Patain, Peter Strandkrone, Joseph Stoll, Kat Moseri, Mix and Match, Michael Gosling, Mikael Fick, and Arno Teva. If you enjoy our work and wish to support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash audioepics, all one word. In exchange, you can receive sneak previews, early releases, extended editions of our audio dramas, music scores, and of course, a stylish coffee mug that says Witch Hunter. Join our cult, so you can say I supported Audio Epics before it was cool. Hello, and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast. Yeah, this time we're on video. That's Hi. <laughs> And uh, the title of this podcast is Morality in Interactive Storytelling. Yeah, and uh, for this uh, episode, we've got a guest. Um, his name is Antonio Padula. Uh, I did pronounce your last name correctly, right? Because I, I never, uh, never yes. really say it out loud. Yes, uh, yes, you did, actually, perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, we're friends, actually. Uh, pen pals, you might say. We met on the internet, and uh, we've talked a lot over the phone and stuff, but we've never met in real life so far. Uh, and Antonio is also one of our patrons. And, yep. uh, yeah, tell us about uh, the project you're working on, if you want. Oh, so I'm, uh, I, I, I played a lot of uh, tabletop RPGs in high school. And I wanted to use that time to, you know, create a hobby. So I wanted to design a game that would uh, incorporate morality into the gameplay itself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I thought at the very beginning. Um, I found that a lot of games, they had uh, morality as a fun mechanic, but people didn't really think about, you know, the implications or how it interacted with them morally mm -hmm. and so i wanted to make a game mm -hmm. where players th thought as they played they thought about themselves as moral characters that's um, interesting oh there, there's so much we could uh, we could ask oh yeah, that, yeah. Like, i started you know, to i started too heavy that's the implications honestly I, of... I just wanted to make a really fun rpg and then it started yeah. getting deeper and deeper so i'm designing a game um for uh well I used to have a specific audience, but now I feel like it, it addresses everyone because I had my 13-year-old uh, nephew uh, play it and he loved it. And then I played it with a couple of friends of mine our age and they loved it. And in the end, it's for everyone. <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, do you uh, have any plans uh, with this RPG? What, what are you planning to do with it once it's, it's done, I guess? Um, well, I want to make it free. Mm -hmm. The ultimate goal is that the rules themselves and uh, much of the basic mechanics are free. They are, what I am basing it on is on the Forged in the Dark game system. Mm -hmm. So that's the game system that uh, Blades in the Dark uses. And um, they, made it, they made it free. They, okay. they have an open licensing so that you can use their basic mechanics and then apply that, make your own game from that. And there are a lot of games that are that come from that. I had no and idea. I'd never heard of that uh, particular it's, system, it, Blades in the Dark. It's very, it's it's really fun. <laughs> okay. And it's actually, a, it's a lot of it, a lot of it's designed so that in most games, if you if you play D&D, &D, mm -hmm. which you have, it, you know, you roll your 20-sided dice and you either succeed or you fail. Mm -hmm. And maybe the DM will add something to it. In this mechanism, uh, success is a lot easier, but it's mostly success with consequences. Oh, okay. Okay. So oh, everything really has like a catch. That. Yes, yeah. but. It's, yes, but it's, yeah. Yeah, yes, buts are the most common thing you get in, okay. in the system. It's kind of I like yes, but it's one of the <laughs> things that Brendan Sanderson always talks about in, yeah. in uh, outlining a plot, like that it right? makes good story for yeah. good storytelling. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's either um, yes, but or it's no and. Uh, mm -hmm. If you really want, I love those. The, the yeah. to get into a bad situation. <laughs> um, okay, so where did you get the idea to do an RPG based on uh, on morality? So I uh, last year I used to teach ethics for mm -hmm. seventh and eighth graders, and I found that they were bored in class. 
mm-hmm. and I would I would teach them in the traditional sense that I would show them Aristotelian ethics, virtue ethics, and they would understand it. But I found that ethics is it's practical. Ethics mm-hmm. has to be practical because it's all about making the right choices. And so I played a little game with them. Okay, let's play a little game where you would make choices. Right. And as I would play that out, I realized I'm basically just playing D and D light with these kids. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I see what. Where, yeah. Where you go. Yeah. And 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 I sat down. And I realized, wow. If you if we can make it fun to make choices and see not only the consequences of those choices in the fictional world, but also mm-hmm. you as a character, mm-hmm. then you could teach virtue ethics without needing it to be too too heavy where it's fun you learn as you do it all right Right. yeah and yeah that's a that's a great approach and out of that came you know i guess also a a a setting a a fancy or sci-fi setting i suppose or (laughs) yes well i always had uh uh as a kid i would always daydream um Mm -hmm. i was a big sci-fi nerd uh mostly because i was traumatized from watching the movie alien as a little kid <laughs> yeah. that, I, I can relate i can relate actually um it, for me it, it was the second one aliens that scared that's me. the one i saw that's the first oh, one okay. i saw <laughs> yeah <laughs> i uh I, I watched it with my cousin when i was i don't even know how old i was i was a little kid and so we would pretend to be the those uh those marines and having aliens oh, wow. and, everything. and that just led up to being interested in really bad sci-fi movies and really good sci-fi movies, <laughs> and then some fantasy. That's so. As a little kid, I would always make fictional worlds. Mm-hmm. World building was what I would do all my free time when I wasn't paying attention in class. When I wasn't, when I wasn't <laughs> doing something, I was world building. Mm-hmm. And um, so I always had this fictional world in in my head, and I wanted uh, a vehicle to communicate that world. Right. Yeah, I also know because you know we're pals um, that um, you're a big fan of Warhammer Forty Thousand uh, and the Fallout universe, right? I am. I am. Which is, which is kind of fan. funny because we are both big fans of uh, Warhammer Fantasy and the Elder Scrolls. So yeah. it's kind of like you know the the, got the, the fantasy the sci-fi. And yeah. Got the, yeah. Yeah. I love Fallout too. Yeah, but the, yeah, right. Yeah, I, um, I love Fallout. Fallout Two Four in particular. Mm. It's almost a perfect game. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it um, setting is great. I I well, I, I like Fallout Two and I like Forty K as well. I mean, but I, my preference always goes to more of you know the swords and magic and woods. I and guess stuff. I guess you read Lord of the Rings as a kid, right? <laughs> Well, I started with the Hobbits. Um, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> that tends to that tends to mark people. As a kid, yeah. I would read the the forty k uh, novels. Right. Yeah. It's it's always you know that first always, yeah. thing that hits you. Yeah, I guess. Well, I saw when I was little. I saw the 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 Lord of the Rings movies, and mm. I didn't understand it too well. Mm. And that's when I told myself I didn't like fantasy. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, it's a but, stupid but you, reason not to like it. You grew out of that particular. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I yeah I grew out of it. I grew out of it because I found, I found what I liked in mm. fantasy. I realized that fantasy has a lot more to offer than, than just swords and mm. bows and arrows and elves. Mm. There's uh there's something about a medieval, a high fantasy setting that taps into. Our basic human nature mm, yeah it, yeah i i kind of feel the same obviously like it, an, an epic an epic battle between uh two guys with pistols is very short yeah but but i, <laughs> I do have to say if you watch sergio leone movies uh-huh it can be incredibly intense and awesome and you know oh, i gotta write that have down. you ever watched uh, the good the bad and the ugly um, yes, I have. Yes. Yeah, the, you know that the final confrontation between those guys—it's a battle of stares, you yeah. know, just eyes. But it's really yeah. intense. The uh, shots are still short. Though, yeah, but yeah. The shooting itself doesn't. The intensity take long, is yeah. in the. Yeah, that's, the eye. With, with fantasy, with fantasy, you can have 
you could see the 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 will and the might of yes. the person uh-huh. fighting. Absolutely. And that's that's really intense. You get pulled into it and you're like, oh, yeah. he's winning, he's losing. There's like a, a an ongoing, it's like a marathon, right? Mm. And with with more modern weapons, it's sort of oh, I saw him, I got him. Done. Unless you got a lightsaber fight, of course. And that's yeah. where Star Wars is amazing. <laughs> yeah, and when you, when you kind of got both of those things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, We've been watching they, uh, Rebels lately, and we, we're totally loving it, right? Yeah, uh, I, I didn't even want to watch it at first. Yeah, me neither. I thought, okay. I, we'll I got really it. hooked. Yeah, really, really like it. The show, Star Wars Rebels. Yeah, it's, uh, the show. I, I saw, I think, I saw one episode. Hmm. Um, but then I don't know what happened in my life. I, I stopped watching it. What I did love was the Mandalorian. I felt like it really kept the original Star Wars feel. Yeah, we, we still have to start watching yeah. the Mandalorian, but it's <laughs> no. it's it's next, you know. It's next it, we, on our list. You want to go chronological, so. But we, we already the Clone Wars bought and, uh, a baby Yoda for our children. So. Yeah, we do, and I did yeah, see that- one episode. Um, yeah, I, I I have seen one episode which I liked. So um, I, I in particular I liked Baby Yoda. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Mandalorian. It's really it it really keeps that mysterious. Uh, there's a bigger universe out there, but we yeah. don't have to tell you everything. Mm. You feel right, and the stories are pretty universal. Mm. Okay. Uh, the the director is the same director as uh, Iron Man. It's, yeah, it's uh, John Favreau, right? Yeah. yeah. And when he talked to George Lucas, George Lucas told him, you have to make, we make stories that are for generations to come, mm. that are applicable across generations. Yeah. And I feel like he keeps true to that because the, the yeah. themes are not specific to our time. They are, yeah. they, they feel universal. And that's, I love it. Yeah, that's great. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I, I feel the same way about Rebels, actually. Uh, everything that you described. Um, so looks like Mandalorian is kind of like a, a continuation of that, but in live action. Yeah. So, also, there are, there are a couple of episodes that deal with Mandalorian. So uh, yeah, it kind of helps. Clone Wars too. It kind of helps to yeah get me into uh, what are Mandalorians, right? Yeah. Come? This 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 yeah these they talk about it, and you you see the difference between different types of Mandalorians. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's 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 curious. Yeah. Okay, but now we're talking a lot about Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> well, Star Wars um, is like one of the yeah the ultimate uh, stories that deal with uh, morality as well. Yeah, right? that's it's, true. It's practically the the core of the and and yeah and and the, the, the Star Wars arc. role playing game, uh, in particular, you know the the Jedi based uh, role playing game, which we yeah. I got the book I can show it. <laughs> yeah. Um, do they have? Do they use the? <laughs> Like in uh, Knights of the Old Republic, the uh, like the light and dark scale. Do they yeah. use those? Yeah, yeah. I hate those. <laughs> no, this is a new game. Um, oh, okay. The Force and Destiny um, Star Wars RPG. It's a very beautiful book. It's uh, got wonderful illustrations. Um, wow. Yeah. It's and well done. Um, it's got a great gameplay system as well. It uses symbolic dice rather than uh, numer- numerical dice. Uh, yeah, they use the, just like in um, the other Star Wars RPG where it's just successes, yeah. failures. and Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 It's, it's uh, from that same line, yeah. But they've got a they whole get... chapter on morality. That's uh, yeah. it's interesting how, how big of a part it plays in what your they... character, how you've got certain moral strengths and moral flaws that you have to pick from and stuff. Yeah. Huh. Huh. Um, that's in other fantasy flight games as well, often, right? The, um, the fantasy one we've played, the Warhammer Fantasy. Yeah, yeah. Warhammer yeah fantasy. they got the symbolic dice too. Yeah. Well, I have a I have a personal issue with with morality as a mechanic. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk about it. Uh, because I started, I I wanted to implement it in my game. I was struggling over uh, creating like a light and dark system, uh-huh. and and I kept playing around with it, but I found that every time I would determine how many points of light, or how many points of dark each decision made, I was making a decision on what was moral and what was not. Mm-hmm. And when you, when a player learns that, it stops interacting with their own morality and starts becoming like a game mechanic 
-hmm. how can I want to yes. play a dark character? So I got to make all the decisions yeah. that make me yeah. a dark character. That's, that's my issue with, yeah. yeah. That's I my issue had with that, Knights of the Old Republic. Knights, yeah, Knights of the Old Republic. For me, it never bothered me in Knights of the Old Republic, which is one of my favorite games ever, because mm -hmm. the game was so, you know, the choices were so clearly black and white, black and white yeah. that, you know, that there were no difficulties in deciding. Yeah. But when we got to Mass Effect, um, it was a little bit different. Um, because I thought in Mass Effect you had you had a kind of a similar system, but it, they didn't call it good and evil. It was more it like, was, uh, are you uh, like a, a knight in shining armor type, or more like an anti-hero type? Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, you're forced to be the hero, Mass Effect. Yeah, you yeah. can't become the villain. Yeah, or, you, you uh, can become a villain exactly, but you yeah. can be a kind of uh, you know a hard ass, shady or, uh, hero kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, or or more well, like the noble knight yeah. type. Um, but by that time, I did feel like sometimes, um, like when I made a choice that I felt was perfectly okay, the game sort of seemed to think that that was a harsh choice, for example. And I and thought, yeah, I didn't think that yeah. was so harsh. <laughs> yeah, and that, that creates a little conflict with, um, yeah. with the player. Um, exactly. So I read, I, read this, um, I read this guy's thesis. Uh, his last name is Sikart. I forgot his first name. And he, he actually studied morality in video games and uh, oh, wow. tabletop games, oh. which I, when I found that out, it's like, okay, I need to learn what he learned and he apply it. Yeah. Yes. And he said that uh, his theory, his thesis says that you cannot, there are two types of people that interact with a game or two types of parts of your personality. There's homo ludicus, which is human being as a player. And then homo poeticus, which is human being as a human being, as mm -hmm. a moral thinker. So when you make a game, uh, the rules of the game interacts with homo ludicus. Mm -hmm. He wants to maximize his chances of victory. He wants to get the most points or he wants to get his strategy down. And homo poeticus doesn't care about that. They, that part of you thinks about other things. And he says, if you want to interact with the morality of a player, have a player think about, okay, who am I going to be in this moment and what sort of decision did this person take? Uh, you can't put it into the mechanics because then what he's doing is min-maxing. Right, he's like, yeah. okay, I want to be a dark player, so I got to make all the decisions yeah. to maximize my dark player. Or, or he might say, yeah. if, if I make the evil choice, I'm going to get this awesome sword. Um, exactly. Yeah. You have to, you actually have to incorporate morality into the story element of the game. So the mechanics, in fact, the mechanics have to, in a way, conflict with the morality. Mm. So, mm -hmm. so if you if you have to make a decision and the mechanics say this is what maximizes your character, but morally you're thinking, but why do I want to do this? I don't want to do this. Why is it making me do this? Mm -hmm. You actually have to think about, okay, do I want to maximize my points or do I want to make a immoral decision? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Yeah. And it's, and it's, uh, well, actually, no, this example would be too, too dark. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, th think of the game of Tetris. All right, Tetris no, has that's no... too dark. No. <laughs> <laughs> Tetris, it's like, it, it's a pretty straightforward game. There's no story behind it, right? You're, mm -hmm. You got to maximize the pieces that you fit in, right? That's the, the game tells you, you got to make rows. Perfect. You know what you need to do? I'm going to try to make the most rows and get most points. Mm -hmm. Now, what if I told you the game, it's Tetris, but now you're putting people on a train and you're kicking people out of a country. So the train now, what you're doing with the train is you're doing something bad with the train. You're kicking people out. So you have to decide, okay, do I want to become a better player and fit the pieces in? Or do I want to be a worse player and get the least yeah. amount of people kicked out right. of my country? Yeah. Okay. And so now you have to, as a player, you're like, uh oh, uh, they're not just pieces, they're people. Yeah. And what do I right. do? And there's a conflict. And so you as a player are interacting with your own morality. Is this right? Is wow. this wrong? What's the right choice? That actually really reminds me of a book, but um, it's hard to talk about it because I'm going to spoil the ending of the novel if I mention it. <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't do that. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> if it's so, one yeah. of those novels where the ending is important. Yeah, it well, is. Yeah. It's really important. Um, I, but yeah, any... there's a certain sci-fi novel out there that kind of has an ending that's really... Um, what does this sci-fi like... novel turn into a movie? Yeah. Okay, then I know exactly what you're referring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, this, this novel... Uh, you you're under one premise the entire novel yeah and the the character is forced to make decisions that aren't exactly moral yeah but the character doesn't know the moral implications of those decisions yeah exactly. until the end and then they yeah. tell <laughs> the big reveal tells them yeah something else it's that yeah. one <laughs> yeah. well we, we really navigated that very well i think <laughs> i hope so i have no idea what you're talking about i'll tell you afterwards okay. <laughs> and then you'll say uh, oh okay yeah we saw that movie oh, okay. yeah i knew i, I, I knew where books? you were going with this i don't think you read the book no um well, the book is good it's a good book yeah and I, but i thought the movie was good uh, it was well done. Yeah, it was very well done. It kind of left out the more political side of the story, but um, which which I I I liked. Yeah, because it makes it more universal. Mm, than, uh, I guess. Yeah. But lots of listeners will not know what. You're yeah, so about either, they'll so. stop talking about extra, this particular extra points mentioned. And a free month of Patreon if you can guess. What <laughs> right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to do with the game. Uh, so what I'm it started working off right now. as um, more like a system to entertain your students. Yes. Then it became yeah. a, a game. And if I understood correctly from what Lumin told me, it kind of became a school thing later on. It, it kind of expanded and you, uh, you used the system to kind of motivate the entire school. Yeah, uh, I used the game to... Well, I don't know if I got the entire school, but I started getting students who were really interested in it and mm -hmm. playing it out. But that was with like my alpha version yeah. that looking back now is completely terrible. Oh. <laughs> I was using like four sided dice and different mechanics and numbers. And I realized it was too many numbers and too much of it needed to be simpler, especially for uh, preteens. It, it needed to be less, less numbers, more action, more decision making. And that's where I got to uh, forge in the dark because I realized I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I just got to, <clears throat> I just got to redesign a car to put the wheel on and then drive that car to really interesting places. I don't know if that metaphor made sense. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't have to, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have to make like a tiny new system. I just found someone right. else's system that works because mm -hmm. really what I care about is what the storyline is and then maybe some little pieces yeah no no i get it now yeah so um since um you kind of mentioned um that you um you <clears throat> you didn't want to focus the morality on the mechanics of the game as such yeah um it comes more from the story um, I assume you're also working on modules or campaigns uh, yes. for this game. So the way the way the the business model behind it is, the game mechanics itself are free, um, but the the campaigns, modules, worlds, cities, those books, the physical books, I would I would sell because everyone likes a nice book. A pretty book in their hands. Oh yeah, because I've, I've blown a lot of money on RPG books in my <laughs> yeah. Life. Yeah, um, I got um, I bought the the Burning Wheel uh, book, mm -hmm. and I loved it. I love okay. the feel of it. I love the how thick it is, how how the shape of it. It's just I I wanted to make something like that. I want to make a product that's that beautiful. Oh yeah, and what I just want to sell is the physical pages. The content I want to make it free. But if you want something pretty, yeah, I'll sell it because you know it costs money to produce the book. Yeah. But I just, I just want. I'm gonna have to insert a meme here of of Gandalf saying, "Don't tempt me, Frodo." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh. So, uh, there are there are mechanics in the game. I don't know where to how how I how I address this. I uh, I'm a big fan of Magic: The Gathering. Uh -huh. um, and I found that their color system was genius. Okay, um, for the 
listeners who don't know what Magic the Gathering is, could you explain? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so Magic the Gathering is uh, objectively the best card game ever designed. Um, it was, it's a card game designed by Wizards of the Coast, same, same makers of uh, D&D in the 1990s. And in this card game, you, uh, you play down monsters and you have different magical spells and your goal is, you know, to drain the life points of another player through many different mechanics. Uh And in the game, there are, the cards have mana, have a mana cost. Like Mm -hmm. you have to be able to play a card, you have to have enough mana on the board to play the card. And those mana have colors. And what magic did with those colors is each color has a certain identity and philosophy Mm -hmm. and mechanics within the game. Originally it was mechanics and then that grew into philosophies. And they're kind of tied to the the elements, right? Yes, like they're they're kind of. Yeah. I, f- I feel like they they touch upon sort of universal values. That's yeah. why I love them so much. So you have the wheel goes uh, at the very top. There's white, so white is the color of order and peace, but it can also become highly tyrannical and controlling. Then it then next to it is blue. Blue is the color of uh, perfection and control and a lot of magic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like cold and rational. Mm-hmm. And then next to it, below it is black. So it's all in a wheel. Mm-hmm. Black is the color of selfishness, the self. It's ruthless. It's uh, people call it the evil color. It's not exactly evil because every color can be evil, but it's the most selfish of all colors. Then, and that has like sacrifices and mm-hmm. blood magic. And it's, it's my favorite color. <laughs> then <laughs> it's always, the dark is always attractive. And then uh, red next to it is red, which is the simplest color. It's passion impulse. So everything, all the, all the cards do is they burn things and the monsters are mm-hmm. really fast. And it's, it's all, it's about no thinking, all action. Mm-hmm. And then next, and then the last one is green. Green is all about harmony, nature. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got the biggest creatures in, in the game. And so the, what's really good about the color pie is their positioning on the pie isn't just a coincidence. Each color is a philosophy that has allied colors, which are the colors next to it, and enemy colors that are on the opposite side. Opposed, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, and so the, the very philosophies, they find common ground with the other colors and they have opposed uh, philosophies with the other colors. And then you get even more complicated when you start combining colors because you can have a deck with cards of two colors or three mm. colors. Even and, op- opposed and, colors. And even opposed, co- and then you, it's it's just, it's infinite. And so what I loved about that is people, you could actually define fictional characters with those colors. You kind of like the, yeah. uh, the alignment roster yeah. from D&D. With the, with, but I feel like it's a lot more nuanced than D&D because right. D&D, it tells you, oh, I'm chaotic, I'm neutral, I'm good, I'm evil. These colors aren't good or evil, they just, they have their philosophy, and when yeah. taken to the extreme, mm-hmm. they may do things that we will consider evil. More like a temperament. It's a temperament. Yeah, yeah. that's that's what I loved about it. So I'm inspiring myself mm-hmm. on those ideas, so that when you create a character in my RPG, you align with a certain temperament, mm-hmm. and so your your characters, uh, I would say vices and virtues go aligned with certain temperaments. And that will affect like the outcome, going back to the game, that would affect the outcome of your character. So in outcome of like the decisions that they make. And so instead of imposing, oh, this character's evil, this imposing mm-hmm. this character's bad, let's say you play a character that's mostly red, the red color, You your character is impulsive. You're very good to action. You're very compassionate. Uh, you may be a character that loves other characters much more easily, but you don't think too much. You're, hmm. you're very, you can be very angry. Your emotions take control. So when you're good, let's say you're a very loving character. When you're bad, you're very angry. You can, hmm. you can have. Hmm. So okay. your char- instead of you becoming good or evil, it's just these are your vices. These are your virtues. Mm-hmm. How are you going to overcome your vices and how are you going to, uh, strengthen your virtues because yeah. it, I found that uh, virtue ethics or Satilian virtue ethics without going too deep never tells you what's good or what's bad 
Mm. It just tells you, you should be a just person. And so you say, okay, who's a, what does a just person do? What is fair? And so you learn from other people what is just and you find examples and you, and you try to be as just as you can. And by trying to be as just as you can, you will find that it's easier and easier to be a just person. What I find interesting about that is that it sort of gets away from this idea of morality that's more like these extreme situations where you put yeah. people in, like, you know, those horrible dilemmas when, you know, you're in a train and you have to choose uh, which yeah. track you're going to, you know, th that one. Um, yeah. Like, you know, that's not really morality because it, it's just, it's not really, it's not life, you know. Um, it, most people will never be in a situation like that. Yeah, and, and, and with virtue ethics, it's every decision you make makes shapes who you are yeah exactly like, yeah, yeah. It, you could you you go home and you can either read a book or watch a movie mm -hmm. and they're both goods according to aristotle everything has a good but there are some goods that are more appropriate for the time and and so you have to pick which good is the good i want to take to lead me to be the person i want to be Am I going to watch Netflix I like the now? fact that you didn't just say some goods are higher than others. You said some mm -hmm. goods are more appropriate for the time. So that puts in even more nuance, actually. Well, Aristotle used to say that the highest good is politics. And then <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and because he thought that it, it, in ancient Greek, everyone lived in, in politics was the, was the governance of the cities, the polis. Mm -hmm. And so he thought that every, the city was everything. And so for the Greeks, your city meant everything. If you were Athenian, that was your most important identity. And so for him, that was the highest good. So everything that would lead to that good for the good of the city was the best good. Hmm. Now today we have nations, we have all these other things. And I so thought, I thought uh, it was Aristotle, uh, but I might be wrong, who, um, who said that um, you know, the, the highest things in life to do are those things we, we do for their own sake. Um, exactly. Like friendship. Yeah. Um, yeah. and and like and like playing um yeah. for example because you don't do it for some ulterior reason because for me when i heard that that was that was really uh, something that really opened my eyes in, in many ways um it kind of conflicts the current mindset that everything should have a purpose and everything should yeah. be uh, yeah like it's very functional. freeing um it makes you know it it, uh, <laughs> it sort of gets you away from this um idea that you know like you can't have a story that's just a good story it has to carry some kind of message um you know it can just be a good story and that in itself is a noble goal right i mean for me that was kind of um an wow, I, I i got i got something i got the opposite from that really uh, yeah i got <laughs> i i got the opposite uh because i found that uh, everything had a purpose mm -hmm. everything had its purpose it's trying to be the best of its kind, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. you're, if you make a chair, you're trying to be the best chair it can be. If the chair can't sustain you, then it's not a good chair. Mm. That's how we can say bad chair, good chair. Bad mm. chair breaks when you sit on it. Good chair does not break when you sit on it. Yeah. yeah Better sure. chair is comfy, <laughs> you know? Uh, I got the opposite. I, I found that like everything had its its place, its purpose. And there are things that are better than others according to their purpose. And, uh, yeah, and do, you, do you think one of the purposes of storytelling is like uh, taking a moral stance or, or conveying a, a moral stance mm -hmm. to the audience? I, I, think it's Im I think it's impossible for a story not to take a moral sense in one way or another. Yeah, I think in every story when a, a writer writes a story, they sort of put elements of themselves and what they think is important and not important. Yeah, exactly. And every single story you may think, you may find stories out there that their purpose was, their story is like, no, there's, they don't tell you anything. Everyone dies at the end. <laughs> but like, like Shakespeare, and Shakespeare, Shakespeare likes killing everyone off at the end of a story. Uh -huh. Yeah. But you realize As along the one. way, <laughs> yeah, along the way, the story tells you things happen that lead to everyone's death. Yeah, that's true. And 
you start thinking, well, I don't want to die. Why do I want to do those things that lead to my death? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, there are stories where, where tragic things happen, you know, for, for no real reason. They're, but they t- don't tend to be good stories. <laughs> and that, see, th- but there you said it. You said they're not good. Mm-hmm. Right. So you think when, when, you say, when you read a story and you say this story is no good, then you have in your mind the idea of then what's a good story? Yeah. yeah. What does a good story do? What, mm-hmm. is it, what does it leave you with? Um, everyone says that Lord of the Rings is one of the greatest books of the 20th century because it leaves you with something more than just the story. The story is the vehicle in which many more things are given. Uh, I think every story has a moral stance and every, and it, it's impossible for it. Then, not then again, at the same time, Tolkien really would have balked at the idea of the Lord of the Rings being a vehicle for a, a message. Yeah, he really was very adamant about that. You know, he, he hated the idea of um, allegory. Uh, he didn't want uh, yeah. people to sort of consider the book as, oh, it's it's a warning about the atomic bomb, for example, yeah. which was a big topic back then. Um, you know, or or you know, it's it's about you know the, the horrors of war, or it's <laughs> yeah, you know, even though you know he clearly puts in these things that makes it very clear. Yeah that he cares about certain issues. Um, but he, he was, it was very important for him that it, it, it would not be considered, you know, um, a vehicle for a message. Well, he didn't him, do- his, his only true desire was to just tell a, a beautiful story, a thing of beauty um, that in itself, you know, is, is worth existing just because it's a beautiful story creation yeah and that for yeah. me that's something that i can really get behind i i, I kind of want to get away from this functional sort of thinking about storytelling which i used to do um and yeah. and uh, and it was very freeing for me to be to I, kind I think of... it's hard also if you're telling a story and and you want to you really want to put a message in there for everyone mm-hmm. to to understand you kind of take the moral high ground don't you? Yeah. Like when, I'm the author and I'm going to tell you what's right and what's wrong. And I think it's, mm. it, it's like a, finding a balance is really hard. Well, it's, it's, it's like, it's like telling someone, um, what would be an example? Um, it, uh, to keep it simple, someone, you have a friend who wants to eat a donut and he does, and the donut's not good for him. Uh, he wants to be on a diet uh, and he wants to eat the donut. So you tell your friend, uh, instead of telling your friend, don't eat that donut, that's bad. Your friend will look at you and say, why can't I eat this donut? Leave me alone. Let me eat my donut. <laughs> yeah. Instead, you go up to him and you say, why do you want to eat that donut? Well, it's delicious. Weren't you doing a diet? Yeah. And does that donut fit into the diet? <laughs> well, no. Then why are you going to eat the donut? Oh, maybe I shouldn't eat the donut. Okay. Instead of, instead of <laughs> telling him what you're doing is bad. I can see you're a good dad. I can see that. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, my children are, my, my daughter is two years old. So when I tell her why, she just looks at me and says, I don't care. I'm just going to eat the donut. <laughs> yeah, one yeah, person's sure. need. Yeah. Still needs, yeah. uh, some... What is this why? What does it mean? I just want to do it clearly because it's there. Yeah. Um, it's Ronan's biggest argument, isn't it? Yeah. But I want it. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I want it. But, uh, it's, it's the ultimate it's the i just want it yeah um it yeah you in, in a story you can't when that just become that becomes propaganda mm-hmm. that's that's where we fall into the yeah. the read the writer wants the reader to take a specific message and in mm-hmm. and if you if in a story in a good story you can take multiple messages from what happens mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um People could always say, people always say in Lord of the Rings, Sam is the hero mm-hmm. because he's the best friend and everything. Yeah, but what about Frodo's internal suffering? Mm-hmm. Isn't he a hero? And then you can sit down and discuss who really is a hero. And then you start discussing what is a hero. No, mm-hmm. it's Aragorn. Clearly, he's the hero. Well, he didn't destroy the ring. Yeah, but he's the king. They're all heroes. Mm-hmm. They're all heroes in different ways. Yeah. In their own uh, 
story arc. That's yeah. what I love about yeah. it. They whole they all have their different story arc. Yeah, but who... it's interesting. Everything you're saying kind of uh, resonates back to me um, with Tolkien again when he said um, that he preferred applicability rather than allegory because he's I, yeah applicability yeah. is about uh, the freedom of the reader and allegory is about the purposeful domination of the author yeah i i completely agree i completely and that's going back to my game that's what i realized you know that's if i made a decision to say this is good this is bad and you are being punished for this and you are yeah. being uh, rewarded for this i am telling you and then you play the game it's like this is stupid i don't agree with this exactly yeah if you if you if i give you a game where you're free to make your decisions what you what you don't choose is your 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 character has a personality and so there are flaws and you accept the flaws okay it comes with the territory i'm i'm uh i'm i'm a rational magic wielding character but i lack a little sympathy for others or this and that they're, they're, this is my flaw yeah and so you will take the consequences of that flaw and then you you start asking yourself okay is this helping me out or not i want to become this sort of hero and i can't because of this vice i have mm -hmm. um instead of instead of me telling you this is bad no no don't do that mm -hmm. you as a player say oh this is going against with what i who i want to be yeah yeah that's inherent to the temperaments being part of the character and not of the yeah. decisions you make. Because a lot of interactive games, they kind of put these temperaments in the in the choices you make rather than the the character you develop. Mm. Like uh, like in Guild Wars Two, when you you have the loyal moral choice and you have mm. the and that kind of adds up to your character. But it's it's more like the choices you you make kind of develop your character along the way. Yeah, th there's a there's also a great um, video game RPG. Um, it comes from Belgium, um, Divinity: Original Sin. Ah, um, uh, yes. And in that game, <laughs> you've got when you 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 pick certain dialogue choices. Um, it kind of it gives you it um, adds certain points to uh, things in your personality, like I don't know, arrogance or you know. Um, conflict avoidance or uh, you know like really specific personality traits um, and and it becomes mechanically interesting when you play with other people because mm -hmm. um, it influ it influences um, you know the outcomes of when you have to actually make decisions together um, so oh, it's there's, a yeah. there's a conflict yeah conflict yeah that's that's something I wanted to put in so have there will be moments where certain checks, We'll have a when you do a check, depending on your stats or how involved you are with your philosophy, you get a certain result, hmm. or you get uh you either I wouldn't say fail, but you get a type of failure. Uh, in, instead of making the characters gain arrogance, my characters they 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 the character gains uh more in their philosophy. They become more and more. If they want to follow through, they become more and more mm -hmm. extreme with their philosophy. And that comes with more positive traits and more negative traits. So you become more extreme. The more you become, the more passionate and compassionate you become, the more angry and impulsive you become. Uh, and you can try to maybe balance it out with another philosophy, but that also comes with its own issues. Do these, in, uh, these moral um, things also come back in in the sort of the lore of your setting like for example yes. you know there are certain spirits for example that, that that will seek you out or something if you are into a specific philosophy or i don't know just saying that's that. what i'm that's what i'm fleshing out um so the universe i created if i can am i allowed to share this information <laughs> uh, you don't have to if you don't like <laughs> it's uh so the the world i'm making is i'm 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 a history nerd and um, I'm a big fan of World War II. I found that it was the last war where people didn't have to press a button and then it's over. You're done, you send a missile or something. It, technology played a big part. Man's ingenuity played a big part, but you still needed P 
people to have bravery to fight to mm -hmm. um and so i'm taking it's a universe where i take some of world war ii's technological advances while keeping medieval europe's social elements and you know of course armor and swords are always cool and so i i i try to keep i want to keep the medieval knight element incorporated in that sort of decentralized and chaotic world of medieval europe with uh modern uh the modern 20th century's social conflicts so medieval meets actually world sounds a little bit like fallout i have to say <laughs> yes I like the yes, brotherhood it of does. steel um I love the I yes, like I, knights in a way. Um, I love the Brotherhood of Steel. <laughs> I've I've always been a fan of Brotherhood of Steel, Space Marines. Yeah. Um uh all these other guys. Uh, I, I I love that sort of medieval brotherhood monk system with modern weapons. It's that contrast right. is really interesting. Yeah. Um and also because uh, shoulder armor. pads. The shoulder pads. <laughs> like, oh yes. <laughs> like in, in Warhammer Forty Thousand, yeah. that's also really yeah. You gotta yeah. have the over, huge, over the top, huge right? shoulder pads. <laughs> it makes you look bigger. It yeah. makes them look all scary and intimidating. Um, yeah, I have I have a whole. I I like I like when people when things are when worlds are designed to like almost the intricate detail. Like there's a love for each detail, and I when it came to like the combat in the world, I really concentrated on what, how would it make sense? Much like Dune, how would it make sense to use a sword with this sort of technology that exists? Yeah. Yeah. They, they really, I mean, Frank Herbert really found a way to, to make swords matter in, in the year 10,000 or something. Yeah. 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 It's something that it, to the point where technology advanced so much that actually using primitive technology is much better than the advanced yeah. technology. Because there's always like a counter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Is, is there some a similar element in Star Wars? I guess. Um, in Star Wars, they have uh, like when they have those shields, and you, when you shoot them, you shoot the ray shields, and and the, the lasers can get through. But uh, you know, if you walk through, you you can actually get through the shield. Um, oh yeah, I remember that. That was that. I love that. So that requires close. I actually thought about that. In in this in my world there is there is there is magic, because mm -hmm. actually you, you kind of convinced me of the importance of magic. I used to not like magic, okay. and, and talking to you made me realize. Hmm, oh, I didn't maybe, know that. I, no I should incorporate magic. Um, I had no idea of that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and it got me thinking. Talking to you got me thinking a lot um, uh, about how do I mix my love for things that go boom. <laughs> and, and like uh, there's nothing cooler than you know the sound of it's the, the primitive feeling of firing that's what makes a heavy so gun so awesome yes yeah, I it's just that. The, 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 the like that sound it's so primitive <laughs> yeah. uh i understand the orcs in the 40k universe when they just scream for more daca and more machine guns <laughs> daca, daca, yeah. yeah um yes this world this world uh it takes it takes the classical medieval feel because I feel like it is in that setting in which each man or and each woman must take on the responsibility of bettering the world. Mm -hmm. So my world my world takes place on a planet called Othello. Okay. And uh, it's called it's uh, Othello. It's also because I'm a big fan of, of Shakespeare. So uh, Othello is a world that was. Uh, raged uh, i mean uh, de devastated by war okay and so you you've you had uh the 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 kokotai was like a, a sort of a, a, a medieval japanese uh shogunate uh um a society that later had internal revolutions in different houses that started fighting amongst themselves and so the world was ravaged by war and so now it's broken down into city states and some remnants of the Kokutai. And so the player in this world, what they do is much like in, um, in Blades in the Dark, which has your character. So 
the way Blades in the Dark work is you are a character, but also you are part of a gang. Because Blades in the Dark is about uh, stealing and doing crime in a city, in a, like a steampunk city. Mm-hmm. So taking those mechanics, I took you play a character, but your character is also part of a guild. And your guild mm-hmm. has a certain philosophy of how they wish to see the world right. made. Mm-hmm. And so you as a character with your own, with a similar philosophy with your guild, but with slight differences, y- and with other characters, you guys take on missions relative to your what your guild does and so in the world you can either become a monster hunting guild or because everyone likes good monsters it's it's, it's always fun to kill a dragon uh or see if you can kill the dragon um at least make the effort yeah (laughs) yeah, at least make the effort (laughs) or die in the attempt um the uh you you your guild shapes this world and you interact with different cities and different societies that have different philosophies and have different issues. Okay. And so you're, you shape the world. The world is in tatters. How are you going to put it together? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so you so that, become a character of influence. Um... Yeah, everyone wants to. I, I've never really understood the, the people who, who play the everyday RPG, like you're an everyday person in an RPG. Mm-hmm. Um, because well, I, I already think, am one. I, I kind of, I always felt the same way um, a, as you, until I actually played uh, World of Darkness as a player and uh, tabletop game. Uh-huh. Um, and um, it was, you know, you got, you know, World of Darkness. It's, no, it's, I haven't. It's sort of a, it's like a, a supernatural horror uh, setting. You know, it's it's basically our world, but there are vampires Vampire and there are, but but people you know is people it, don't know that you know it's kind is of, this the game that's it's it's it powered by the apocalypse mechanic? I think so. Okay. It, yeah, I think I might know that one. It's got a dice pool with details. Is it like is it like Cthulhu, Call of Cthulhu, where where combat is deadly or it's not really a good idea to get into fights? Uh, I don't know. Um, Vampire the Masquerade does that ring a bell in any way? Um, yes, but I haven't played it. Okay, so that that's World of Darkness. Okay, so, so you've got the basic setting, and then you've got all these specific games within that setting. You can play as a vampire, you can play as a werewolf, or whatever. But what we played was the basic book, World of Darkness, where you just play as a normal human being, mm-hmm. and we were playing like you know really flawed, uh, average people, but very different from ourselves, and. Um, and I felt actually that uh, the, the horror element of the story was much more powerful because of that. Oh, I felt agree. Like, you know, um, you know, you were alone in a, in a dark yeah. house with a supernatural entity. You really Delicate. felt like it was, there was real danger there. And it was interesting to inhabit, you know, a completely different person than myself. Yeah, the, the games that try to create horror, they have to... Uh, make you feel helpless. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's where the horror kicks in because yeah. it, the the best horror video games I've ever played were the ones where you didn't get a weapon. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't never played a game like a video game like that, but it, it's. Oh, um, I've always been interested in in um, Alien Isolation. That looks like a cool Alien Isolation. You actually get a weapon. Oh, okay. Uh, at some point, and that's when it stops being scary for me. Okay. Um. <laughs> But it's a it's a very good game, and the AI is is very good. But in uh, the best one I've played was Outlast. Okay. That one's very it's very dis- it's very disturbing. It's very R rated um, as as a horror game. There is you know gore, um, but in this game you are a whistleblower. You have a camera, and that's it. And the camera oh, has a, a night vision element, and that's it. And you run out of batteries too, and so. Your goal is to find out what the story is, but you go into a mental asylum where everyone's crazy. Okay. <laughs> and so it's very, uh, it's very terrifying because you can't do anything. Um, but that, I thought that, um, scary, Alan yeah. Wake was scary already. It was. I know, but you I, get a gun I in that game. Yeah. You get I, a gun, but very, yeah, yeah. very little ammo. You and have I, to be very I, sparing. And I find games much scarier than, than movies. In that sense, you have to do it yourself. You have to do it yourself. No. Yeah. So yeah. you are, you are helpless. 
Exactly. I've played a pacifist character in Skyrim, and that was scary <laughs> too. When you uh, wear your yeah. headphones and you get into yeah. a dungeon, you know, just and you can't do anything. Arms, yeah. Arms. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's uh yeah. I I I'm also a very big fan of horror, um, especially um, a Lovecraftian horror. Right. Right. The, the the sense of the unknown. Um, I think for me, that is the most terrifying in movies. When I see the, when I see the monster, I'm no longer scared, mm. but I know what I'm dealing with, unless it's a spider clearly, <laughs> but it, if it's, if it's anything else, once I see the monster, I'm like, okay, I know what I'm dealing with. Um, yeah, I know what you mean, but yeah, when it can, it can be really effective if you see like glimpses of the monster. Yes. Yes. You're like, Oh, what is that? Why is it? Why yeah. is it slimy? Where, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you hear them. That's I think those are are much much better. And that's actually I actually have that horror incorporated in my lore. Um, since cool. as as a player, I because I live a normal life. When I play a game, I want to play someone who's not normal. Sure. Yeah, I, exactly. I completely get that. So. Or even uh, less normal than you usually are. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> in, in in my game, you're you're already considered a hero. Okay, you're a hero. You you're very skilled in certain things uh, already, but uh, what you do with those skills and how you overcome your own personal passions is really the test of it and the consequences of that. You're very good with a sword, great, but you you just you killed the the noble king because of whatever reason. Now, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Um. So how do you incorporate horror into that? Well, you have to find a way to make people feel helpless, even though they're skilled. Mm -hmm. So I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do I make that Lovecraftian horror uh, element in those creatures that you can't destroy. How, how do I incorporate that one? I'm still working out the kinks. You could introduce some kind of kryptonite. <laughs> um, yeah. Know, take away the power, but kind of cheating i guess yeah it does feel like cheating right i you can't tell yeah. you oh no now you have no power when you're in front of this guy yeah. uh i want to keep them powerful but i guess make the consequences bigger so you try to you try to overcome the the creature but the price you pay for overcoming is even more so do you want to take that risk uh yeah i, I guess um if if the focus is on the morality of it I guess it's it's kind of like Superman. Uh, I'm wearing a Superman T-shirt, by the way. Um, uh, not not relevant. Uh, but it's kind of like Superman, I guess. Um, you know, how do you write a story for Superman that's in any way exciting or interesting? You either have to take away his power, mm -hmm. right, or you yeah. have to confront him with some kind of moral dilemma, where he wonders, yeah. "Well, should I use my power here or not?" I guess, right? Yeah. Now, now take Superman and give him a deep personality flaw, then that would be, that would be really interesting. Like uh, Superman, but he's addicted to gambling or something. Right. Well, he's yeah. addicted to Lois Lane. That's a personality <laughs> flaw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a yeah. That's, yeah, that's think, a weird thing that whole I think if Lewis he, Lane. If he didn't fall in if he didn't fall in love, he would just be more focused on using his powers for good. But, I mean, then he would have no love. Yeah, that's true. What kind of existence is that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, go to the I, I think I mean I'm not I'm not a comic I'm not a comic book <laughs> reader. Um, but I did think that the the movie, the Batman versus Superman movie, kind of did handle the whole you know superman's dilemma uh, element yeah he well. has superman has a big risk of becoming a, a god amongst men and then imposing his will on others because mm -hmm. he yeah, exactly. is and everyone powerful. was afraid of of him and 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 you know um, people were kind of turning against him and you know that that theme was explored in in that movie um, i know it was based on comic books but i've never read them it's it's that um it's that interesting um uh, the, the concept that a uh, good men aren't uh, aren't in incompetent like good men isn't a good man isn't a man who's not dangerous he's mm. just a man who's dangerous and chooses not to be mm. right so like Superman is incredibly dangerous but he chooses to do it for good than for evil mm -hmm. but you know if Superman one day says you know what 
I'm king of this world. Who's going to stop him? Yeah. yeah, that's the strength of the character, really. Mm. Uh, and, and that's also cool about the, the fact that he just lives an, a normal life at first, uh, being raised by these normal parents yeah. who just want to teach their son values and be a good man, basically. Yeah. It's like uh, at the end of uh, the movie, Man of Steel, when, when the soldier asks uh, Superman, um, how do we know you're not going to turn against us? against America's interests. And he said, well, I grew up in Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, that's a valid question. That's that fear that, oh, you're so competent. Uh, you could become a dangerous enemy. Mm. And that's something, that's something that's really interesting when you were either playing games or reading stories about heroes. Uh, I don't really see that very often how do you well you see it in some of them i think in harry potter you see it there's like a temptation to become evil hmm. uh you're now a very powerful person what's hmm. keeping you from becoming evil because it's easy it's 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 actually much easier if you're weak to say well i'm one of the good guys because i'm not powerful enough to actually impose my will upon the world and become evil yeah but even yeah but even then you can you can actually be evil and dangerous um or you're you're kind of like sneaky, trying to get yeah. whatever you can. Yeah, and you know, or sort of like uh, Gollum manipulate. Yeah, I guess a good example. Yeah, but Gollum isn't isn't weak. I mean, he, See? He, yeah. he, can do, he can do stuff. He oh, can do a weak. Stuff. That's the thing that the the little weak guy, the the weak enemy, isn't scary. What are you gonna do? Complain about me being good? <laughs> yeah. But if if they have some sort of competence, like if he's very manipulative. Or they're very convincing. Mm -hmm. Now, one could use their persuasion skills for good and keep people together, or they can use it for evil to divide. Mm. And then you go, there's the competence once again. Yeah. So then yeah. I, it, it goes back to like to morality. That this is why I think like in, in stories, uh, morality is it's always there because you're always showing people what you can do, mm -hmm. what you should do. I feel like every story is trying to tell you what you should do by showing you what happens when you do this yeah. mm -hmm. or when this person does that or when the other person does this thing. And then you sit down and you look at it and say, do I want to become this person? No, then I shouldn't be making these decisions. And a, and a bad story, you read it and you're like, this doesn't make sense. Why would a person with this personality flaws all of a sudden do this? Or, but of course, yeah. you do have stories where things happen in spite of the character's actions. Or, for example, you know, in spite of their best intent, you know, like stories where people get um, wrongfully accused of some crime. Yeah. For example, um, because somebody else um, is evil and, um, you know... Um, or they, they kind of cause accidents because you try to avoid it uh, right yeah stuff like that um <clears throat> so uh, yeah what moral point does that make um yeah, well there you there you go back to um so it's with virtue ethics it's really not about the the consequence in yeah, fact it's it's to become but, an but... agent of good so let's say yeah you read those stories where no matter what they do they get their own in jail, let's say. Mm -hmm. They don't stop being a good character. Do you still, mm -hmm. do you dislike that character all of a sudden? No. No, no, no. You, no. Actually, you actually love them more because yeah. they're taking their suffering nobly. Yeah. Or, or they, sure. they, they, despite being going to jail, he didn't lie or he mm -hmm. didn't use the, the one secret to use it against his enemy or something like that. And so you look at that character and you still look at them with admiration. It's despite all the bad consequences that happen, there's something in you that looks at them and but says, I, 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 I want to be like that. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is what you then need is that is an audience that already accepts um, these kinds of ethics, you know, virtue ethics. Hmm. Uh, if you have an audience that watches like the same movie from a, a vantage point of, you know, uh, consequentialism, consequentialism. Yeah they might conclude, oh, if I do this good thing, apparently, you know, bad stuff can still happen to me, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, and yeah. that might be the, 
the, the message they get from that. <laughs> That's the not thing ideal. Is, the thing the thing that happens with consequentialism is a lot of the examples are 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 short term or they're mm -hmm. they're like a little sliver of something that happens. So you don't see the ripples, you don't see the other side effects. It's like I can't think of a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I mean, like a storyteller could, you know, you yeah, could have a, a storyteller who thinks that way and it could show a story in that way and it, thereby give, you know, I guess a wrong moral message. I, I, I agree. I agree. Because you're cutting a little section. You're looking at a little section yeah. in a story. You're not showing the yeah. real consequences, I guess. Or because the, or maybe... Else. 10 years later, or because this person went to jail, this other person and the way they suffered nobly and motivated someone else to be, I don't know, uh, save a child from a fire or, mm -hmm. or that person in jail, they, their life was terrible, but they helped these other criminals turn around their lives because of who they were in there. So maybe they, they did good in there, but you don't see that in like the entire movie. The, what I think if I do this right with my game is most campaigns are long-term, correct? Mm -hmm. They, you do a bunch of things. And so as your character becomes more virtuous, everything they touch because of their, because of how good they are, will slowly improve despite other bad consequences. Their general tendency is to improve the world. Mm -hmm. If you play him like that, or you can become evil. If yeah. you want to i do i think it's very challenging for a games master um yeah I, that's master has to be well versed in yeah that's that's uh, my biggest ethics, that's right? that's our biggest challenge is how do i help the game master uh play the game that way that create a story that gives them the freedom to tell the story they want to do but gives them the tools to uh fulfill our objective which is how people think ethically yeah that's that's our big challenge that's that's what we're still working on today wow yeah um without yeah. without bombarding him with rules and things because the gm you got to give him freedom because yeah. they're also like developing being tied a down. video game i guess it, you could focus it all a bit more on the the narrative than yeah easier but but i'd have to do I'd have to do so much coding and so many events and so many because video games are much shorter than a than a tabletop session. Right. And tab and tabletop, yeah, activities. How do you deal with justice in your games? Like, uh, you, you know, when you make a good choice, you will affect things in a positive way. But what if you don't? Um, yeah, with the co the consequences. Yeah. Those are actually those are even the best kind. Um, those are called uh, wicked problems. So you you make a decision that you think will have a great consequence. Uh, there's an example of this in actual in Fallout in Fallout Three. Yeah. Uh, for those who have played Fallout Three, there's uh, Fallout Three is a post-apocalyptic game, and um, there's this place called Tempany Towers. Um, and Tempany Towers is sort of uh, they try to live the world as it was before the war and they have comfortable beds and they live well while the rest of the world, they're living in, in a wasteland, terrible lifestyle. And these people, they're these, these group of people called the ghouls who are people radiated by the radiation. Their, their, their skin is all drooping off and they're very, very hideous. And they don't let the Tempanese Towers doesn't let the ghouls in. They don't let them live in because they don't want to look at them. And the ghouls don't like the Tepany Tower because they're elitist and they won't let other people in. And so you have a mission. You're giving missions to each of them. So from, from each of them. So the ghouls tell you to kill everyone in Tepany Towers to let the ghouls in. And the ones in Tepany Tower tell you to kill all the ghouls and to get rid of them because they don't want to look at them. And you actually have an option to, to broker peace between them. Mm -hmm. And so when I played, I brokered peace between them. Yeah. Uh, because... I wanted to become the noble peacekeeping character. But you know, when you come back to that place after hours of gameplay, you find out that the ghouls killed everyone inside the tower. That's and so you, so you get there and you're like, I want it to be good. Yeah. Because yeah. As, a, as a player, you're thinking, I want to maximize my decision-making. I'm the, 
I am the peaceful character. So everything I do has to stay the way it is. Yeah. And that doesn't always happen in life. Mm -hmm. um, but as a player, you made a moral decision. What does a just person do? Or what does a peacekeeping person yeah. do? And you made that decision. And that Regardless actually has a consequences. Yeah. And that has a consequence as you as a player yeah. and as a human being. You made that decision. And then no matter when you come back, you say, oh, it went terrible. You could become cynical and say, why did I do that? What was the point of that? But you didn't have all the information. Yeah. You made the best decision with what you had. So you're saying you have to let go of that because I know that was one of my biggest frustrations while playing Bioware games. I used to just look up what the outcome would be because yeah. I was afraid I would lose one of my party members or the other if I made a, a decision. And I did the same. Like, so stressful <laughs> and you know yeah. that i was very that, good at that yes. yeah dragon age uh, yeah that actually ruined uh that ruined a lot of the games for me yeah. when i would do that i would look up the games and then it stopped it was still fun but it wasn't as fun i think exactly yeah uh problem. what was the game i think it was mass effect 2 was one of the first games i played where i didn't look up anything and to this day is the game I love the most because that first experience, yeah, that first discovery, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I made every decision. I really thought through every decision with the information I had. I think. But I, I tend to overthink things. I think, and I, and I'm, I'm afraid that will. Uh, isn't that an issue that it, it might kind of suck the fun out of a game if you make if you have to make a lot of moral choices, you're like it's like really stressful and takes out the entertainment of it. The, the entertainment. Yeah. That's why it. you can't, you can't bombard a player all the time with that. Yeah. It has to be an element, but not, not too, that has to be fun into it. And that's, that's a big challenge with game makers. Yeah. It's, I can imagine have, it's making it fun. Cause I, I can make I balance it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. That's still the challenge. That's why when I, when I first made the game, everyone was an average human being. And I realize I don't find that fun. Mm. Uh, I like being really powerful. I like being a magician. I like being a powerful knight and everything. And then how do I wield that power is really what I care about. I use, when I would play a lot of RPGs, I would cheat and make my character super powerful. And so I wasn't worried about min-maxing. I was worried about making decisions. Yeah, that makes the game more interesting yeah. in that way. Yeah. yeah. They they like they re-released the old uh, Baldur's Gate titles, which were you know the early Bioware RPGs where you had all these choices and stuff. But they had very difficult combat and could take you know dozens of hours to get through them. But they re-released them now with a story mode, so you can just play and not care at all about you know your stats, the combat, your yeah, and whatever. Uh, and just be in the story. And um, I think that for some people, I, I think for a lot of people, that's actually a blessing. Um, yeah, that, I, I love those. I love those games because I stress out less about missing out on that special sword or missing out on those stats. And now I'm going to suffer through the next, next combat because I didn't do that. My brain is thinking differently. When I play those games where combat is an element, but it's a story element and it's all about the decisions you make in a story. I feel more immersed in my character because mm. I stop in a situation and I go, okay, what do I do? I don't like this guy, but I can't just get rid of him because of these reasons yeah. or I don't, or <laughs> do I save the village to destroy the monster or do I let the monster go and sa save the village? What do I do? I, like it's, I, I like those. I like those decisions. Have you ever played these Telltale games? Like they did the a Walking yes. Dead. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 played, I played a part of that, and I was I, I really enjoyed it. Actually, it was I played it on a tablet, um, and it was very different from anything I'd ever played before. It was really just a story, and you have to make choices, and that's it. Nothing else. No yeah. riddles. No. Yeah. No combats. Just choices. In that regard, uh, do you think uh, there's a, a difference, a different approach to morality uh, in video games uh, versus tabletop games? Because you kind of have a different uh, dynamic there as a, as a game player. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's a lot more freedom uh, with 
tabletop games clearly uh, because the only limitation is your imagination. Yeah. Now the issue the issue you have with tabletop games, most tabletop games is uh, especially the RPGs, you have a game master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you actually have another human being making who is fundamentally moral as well, making decisions too. Yeah. While in a in a game, you have just a me mechanics working, and they don't really take into consideration who you are, what you're doing. It's cause and effect. Oh, I do this and that. And this happens, and it's really up to the designers incorporate pieces and morality to it um do i think morality is different it depends how you design the game yeah um it really depends how you design the game while with a rpg i have to see how i give them tools to play a game and then little tools to incorporate the morality or at least to give the gm the tools to incorporate morality or moral decisions i sort of have to make the i have to make the setting right yeah. require them yeah yeah, I guess it's more about the setting. It is. Uh, it's it's uh they uh it depends on the game as well, of course, because you know, like in a tabletop game, you can always decide as a games master uh, when when your players suggest they uh, they just solve the riddle without a fight or or they compromise. You can say, yeah, well, okay, that's another path. You just go on, and in a gameplay. Sometimes a fight is required. You cannot just say, yeah. um, I think in, in yeah. Bethesda games, it's often um, an option that you just solve the conflict by being a diplomat or something mm -hmm. that, that occurs occasionally. But not all gameplay systems uh, allow for these. Yeah, games. yeah, sure. I mean, you need to do yeah. your grinding for XP and yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah. And I guess in a way you can kind of in in a in a video game you just you take it or leave it that's the just the yeah. game system rules but mm -hmm. when when a tabletop um when you're playing a tabletop game you can negotiate with the the game master yeah. of course yeah yeah yeah, that, yeah that, 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 right yeah there's that human element to it yeah i, I feel like uh, in in video games it, it always kind of boils down to a choice you know like this bifurcating choice which choice are you going to do yeah. Whereas in a tabletop game, you could, you know, perhaps always find some alternative that the 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 author of the module or or the game master never thought of. Um, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and and the yeah, exactly. the um, you cannot program it, that. Yeah. In a video game, you can always look up the consequences. Also, yeah. In a in a tabletop game, you could make the consequences very random. Mm. Right? It's of outside factors. And so the consequences become less. You're you're looking for the best consequences, but if they're so random, then you have to concentrate on something else when it comes to designing your character and shaping the world. Right. You know, it's if the consequences aren't the only. Now that now that might bother a lot of people because there's that whole, I saved the puppy, uh, but by saving the puppy, I've destroyed the world. You're like. That's that just drives me crazy. When that's that would yeah. just drive you crazy. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's there's a delicate balance to play, uh, to try to avoid that whole mechanical consequentialism. How do I get the best yeah. outcome? Yeah. But then at the same time, how do you make it align with, uh, how do you make it? align with the you know the decisions that you make how do you uh make it so that you're thinking more about who am i rather than what is the outcome going to be hmm. yeah it, so, now, it's, it's not easy i was just thinking when you said mechanical consequentialism i think that that more applies to video games yeah but when in a tabletop setting there's a different kind of meta gaming i guess that may be mm -hmm. going on it's like i know this gm I know kind of what his moral views are or, you know, or what kind of movies he likes or, you know, so I know what I got to say or do here to get the consequences yeah. I like, you know, that, that might, yeah. all, I mean, that's happened to me as a GM. I, I, players have come to me and, and said that. So <laughs> like uh, yeah. an oral exam, you, you know, exactly what you have to say to please yeah, the like, teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's one of the, 
I don't. I wouldn't call it an obstacle because it's really not an obstacle. No, I mean, you can't get around. There's account. no way to. to There's get no around. way. So I don't want to. I don't want to put a square peg into a circular hole. Like I don't want to no. force anything on the GM. What I want to. I am. I am looking for a specific crowd, people who want to deal with those moral yeah. moral issues in the game. No, otherwise, um, they they just pick some other game. Otherwise, they would yeah. pick some other game, and so I want to give them the tools to make it, you know, fun. I also imagine it was actually originally designed for parents to play with their kids. Hmm. Um, but then, so when you went for the <laughs> post-apocalyptic uh, guns and stuff, you thought, okay. yeah, I thought maybe parents with their teens. <laughs> yeah. Um, or yeah, because. I have to at least love the world. I, it has to be passionate for me, of course, or else yeah. I won't work on it. Um, and so I'm trying to find that. It's still, it's, it's still a work in progress, and trying to find that audience that likes the theme, likes the game mechanics, and I guess the morality element is much more becoming much more subtle than okay. it started out. Now it's now it's more. Who am I? What kind of decisions am I going to make? It's not just, oh, I'm chaotic. And so now I'm just going to cause chaos wherever I go. It's more, I believe in this. I think this is important and this is not important. So I'm going to make these decisions that are important. And maybe this is not the time to make these kind of decisions. Like you're, you're a character that your character falls in love with everyone they meet and you're in court and there's a king and his daughter is there. And now is not the time to start <laughs> asking the daughter for her hand in marriage when you're trying to solve an issue between two yeah. rival houses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that is not actually, that's not the moral decision at that moment because it's not the, it's, it may be an appropriate moment in another it may be appropriate at a different moment, but right now, no. But your character really wants to do it. And so you you try to roll to fight against it, and up, uh, nope, your character goes ahead and does it. Right, mm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. Your, your character might feel different motivations, different impulses than you do. Yeah, that's that's the thing. That's yeah. you you are the rational side of your character. Yeah. You are his will. And you can strengthen yourself by decisions that you make. You can strengthen your will. Mm -hmm. But if your character is more aligned to their desires, you're going to have less control over him. But there's like more power associated to it. There's, a, there's an attraction to making your character more aligned with their uh, temperament. Yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder um, if I were ever to play this game, if what kind of character I'd play, would I play someone who's closer to how I am in real life or someone who's completely different with very different? Well, I, I'm creating, I'm, I'm actually creating a, like a, a little test uh, that creates your, your alignment depending on your decisions. So I found out that the, um, the color pie fits in well with the big five personality traits. Oh, okay. And so when you take a big five personality trait uh, test, you, I don't know if you guys know the big five personality like trait. Those, with those four I know or five letters? There's, it's, uh, it's a degrees of openness. So interest in abstract ideas, degrees of extroversion. So it can be extroverted or introverted. Oh. Uh, degrees of neuroticism, which is how emotionally stable you are. So low neuroticism, high neuroticism. Uh, how, do, how much do I have? A three openness, uh, conscientiousness, which is uh, your sense of duty and control, uh, which is high or low. And then one, two, three, four, five. What was the last one? And agreeableness, how, how agreeable you are, how trusting you are of others. And so I realized that the colors have an alignment to certain ter personalities of high or low levels. And the then depend. Uh, personality test but that has like two parameters remember that the disc one. Oh, the disc yeah and and then the 16 personality profile but i've never heard of this five. this one the, the big five they actually they've been using it for for years now and they've okay. have this study across countries and and nations and cross-culturally 
and they found that there are there is like common ground between cultures and Mm. and their description of people's personalities Mm. and so i found that that fit in kind of well and so if you have a certain personality you align naturally to a certain type of philosophy it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the philosophy you would like to follow (laughs) it is the philosophy that you naturally follow whether you want to or not Oh, but yeah, you might you you might not agree, but it 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 is actually what your personality is most like. So yeah, so like um, the white color, white mm-hmm. is or in in my fictional universe, it's uh, ghee, the color of of order and peace, and the two personality traits that go with it are high in conscientiousness, so hard work and duty, yeah. and high in agreeableness, because you agree you you look at the collective, you want order. Uh, you want things to fit where they're supposed to fit. Everyone has a responsibility. Everyone has a duty and everyone gets along because they're in the place they're supposed to be. Um, the issue with that is you may be very cold to people's desires. You may, you're very structured. You don't break laws ever. That would be D and D's, uh, lawful good. Lawful good. Mm-hmm. Well, it might not be good because you could be tyrannical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because what you care about is order. Even when the law is corrupted, you'll still follow Even it. when the law is yeah. corrupted, you will follow it. Yeah, and even uh, in, D- in D&D, then you would be lawful evil. But yeah. Or lawful neutral or lawful, like you're just... Yeah. Yeah. So within kind of your broken. philosophy, within your philosophy, you could be good or you can be evil. Mm-hmm. Depends on how extreme you become with your philosophy. Yeah. Or, or yeah, or whether you use it in appropriate situations or not, I guess. Like the law says, if you steal bread, your hand will be cut off. Typical moral decision. Mm-hmm. And so you find a, a father who stole bread to feed his family. The typical question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The law says one thing. What do you do? Mm-hmm. And so in other moments, you may follow the law and keep the order. But in this moment, you're like, ah. And so you're... Your character's personality, the decision you make, uh, whether or not you succeed, also if you succeed or fail in the role, that also adds to whether you go deeper or further away from your philosophy Hmm. or you shift to another one. Yeah. So I I guess um, to, to, to make matters interesting, it's very important in your setting that it's, it's not a kind of um, utopian ideal setting. No. No, it has to be dystopian. Like there have to, yeah. it, it has to be a world where there are unjust laws, for example, right? It's it's a it's a world where different factions are trying to form the world according to their ideals. Right. Yeah. And so you, as a guild, you take a role in that, and so you believe in a world. You can either believe in a world of maximum freedom and passion, but then there's a lot of chaos on that side, or you believe in a world where people look out for their self-interests only Mm. or it's self-interests and a lot of uh and perfection or there's a lot of harmony and and justice but it's very cold and uncompromising uh there's there's this you can mix and match and and that's what i loved about the magic color wheel there's some things i disagree with it and i'm adjusting to my game um but I, I, I love it because it doesn't pick like this is the good color. This is the bad color. It's just this is just the color. And this is what it believes. And if you combine them, they start believing different things. Wow, like, I get, sounds I guess, actually, what's the title of your game? We, we haven't we don't know that yet. Uh, so the name of the game is Erebus. 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 Uh, how do you spell that? E-R-I. E R E B U S. Erebus is that what I wrote? Okay. Cool. Uh, that was a recent update because I've I've gone uh, I've changed the name <laughs> over oh. and over again. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. At one time it was gonna be called Vices and Virtues. Uh, yeah. Because like it went well with like B M V. But then oh. I felt like a less direct name would uh yeah. would work. Okay. Yeah, I know. I like that Erebus. It it kind of it's kind of got a, a space opera feel to it. I think. <laughs> yeah, there is there is like a space element in the lore, uh, but I I've yet to flesh it out a lot uh, because in this universe, uh, space is actually filled with liquid. 
Oh, uh, I, I it's like, like that. A, it's a dark liquid, and so combat in space isn't. Uh, it isn't like oh, I shoot a laser over here and I get you. It's <laughs> like it's actually like, it's, it's it's submarine combat wow. and, and broadside cannons and and stuff like that because it's cool. But I never understood in Star Wars why did the ships just go next to each other and shoot each other? Why did you just shoot a big laser from very far away? Yeah, and why I, is there I, noise? I recently thought in, in Star Wars like if when when they shoot a laser and they miss, doesn't it just keep on going? Yeah, <laughs> forever and ever until just someone shooting everything is just, in its just way, unluckily yeah. sort of gets hit by some laser that yeah. was shot a thousand years ago. Yeah, that's what I, that's that's true. That's what I was thinking. It's like oh, they're shooting all these lasers and some poor dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's uh yeah, but that the the space combat it's I've yet to, but that's where my um. My Lovecraftian horror comes from where there are creatures from beyond that are that are powerful yet there aren't evil. They just don't care about you. Mm, okay. Right. So you're we're like ants to them, or well, yeah. yeah, and that sense of where their their influence is everywhere too, even in the philosophies. And so there's a, there's a whole conflict about about that. Now there is there is a good. I do have a good in this world because everything sounds evil, mm. um, but it's more subtle than than what. Uh, than what it's not just there's some sort of good god, and so you follow this good god. And oh, I'm still so fleshing it out. I'm still so fleshing it out so it makes hmm. philosophical sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Um. Very interesting. Um. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there will be people. Um, I know. I mean, one of, one of our other patrons uh, we chat to regularly um, is very big into role playing games as well. So he might be very interested in this. Yeah, and he's so. he's uh, very into uh, developing worlds. Yeah. World as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, I need to play test it a lot more so people can tell me how horrible it is and how <laughs> I can fix it. <laughs> Oh, really looking forward to seeing more of it. And um, yeah, my uh, my plan is yeah. my plan is to have a, a by next by August of next year mm -hmm. to have uh, the basic rules set up and maybe two or three quest lines. Okay. Um, and then work from there. Oh, great! Yeah. Sounds cool. Yeah. 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 I, I've I've um I've been in the Discord. But um, I mean, we've got our own Discord, and I I don't post. No, it's there. it's been very it's been uh, very quiet. <laughs> it has been very quiet, um, mostly because a lot of my work, a lot of the work I've been doing has been. Well, first of all, these since school started, I, I work at a, since I work at a school. These first few weeks have been uh, pretty hectic, yeah. so I haven't worked. I haven't worked on it, and most of the time when I work on it is. I don't update the Discord. I just sit down and write in my notebook everything. I just let my mind flow. Mm -hmm. And so I forget to tell other people what I'm doing. <laughs> Until like two weeks later, I'm like, oh, by the way, I wrote this entire combat system. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I have been, I have been, it's been slowing down lately. Work and family has slowed things down. But I, I, I really... I want to set up a Patreon, set up a whole, a whole, uh, a whole ecosystem for this, because I want people to, I want people to play it and like to play it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you got this stupid ad. <laughs> <laughs> it suddenly came up. Um, yeah. No. Um, looking forward to to play testing it. Maybe if uh, if you uh, if you're looking for people. Uh, once you're closer to uh, the yeah, when I get a finished product, I think I'll I uh, I'll uh, invite people over to set up a, a certain campaign. I gotta practice my GM skills with Blades in the Dark, with the Force <laughs> in the Dark system. Right. Um, but uh, I I know nothing about that system. I, I've I've been into a lot of different RPG systems, never heard of Blades in the Dark. Yeah, look look up look up Blades. I recommend it. Um, I I like it. I like the whole idea behind it. Um, 
Okay. The entire philosophy for it is that it's that uh, yes, but philosophy. Okay. Um, and the dice system is pretty simple. It's a uh, it's a six sided dice. It's a six sided dice pool where you pick the highest value. Mm -hmm. uh, if all, if all things go well, you pick the highest value, and uh, that tells you the results. That either tells you success, success with consequences, or failure. Right. Okay. Or like or critical success, stuff like that. Okay. And then different factors determine how many dice and everything. And, you know, they start playing with that. Um, and, but it's really simple. You can just steal the dice from your Monopoly game because people don't play Monopoly anymore. Or maybe they still do. <laughs> if, they like the, if they like their family, they stop playing Monopoly and they, they, play, uh, they use those dice. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, D6s are, are everywhere. They're easy yeah. to get a hold of. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, okay. Um, looking forward to to seeing more. And um, thanks for for uh, being on our podcast. Um, oh, Jeremy, thank you our, for our inviting me. Guest ever. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the the uh, first one was our composer Peter. Um, we uh -huh. had a, a nice long conversation with him. Um, and and the first a, visual guest. You're the first one uh, people can actually see. So oh well, because I can't physically come visit you. No, no, that, no, that, that, that would be lovely, but maybe someday. Uh, it's not, a, it's not yeah, allowed. We, we're actually in a very cliche way. We're eating Belgian chocolates right now. Oh, um, <laughs> so jealous. We could offer uh, you we've one. got Belgian beer in the fridge. So yeah, well, did, I'm, I, I, I'm mentioning the only two things that Belgium's kind of like awesome. <laughs> beer. <laughs> well, I, I love, I love both. I wish, okay. I wish I could fly over and we can discuss the combination is not always beer. successful, though. Beer and chocolate? And no, beer. Uh -huh. Probably no, not, not at the same no. time. Well, uh, what about beer and waffles? Aren't you guys really good with waffles? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, or yeah. fries. 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 I remember sure. Belgian fries are the best fries. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with beer. We, yeah. We've got a, yeah, a whole tradition surrounding that. Yeah. And the waffle sure. things, I, actually, we, we only eat waffles when it's someone's birthday or something. Yeah. There's no thing with eating waffles at, at breakfast. That's yeah, actually that's something that's Americans American thing. do. Yeah we, yeah, we have our, we have our, I noticed that in Europe, there are a lot of meals that people have for dinner. Like in Spain, they have fried eggs for dinner. We have all that for breakfast. We get that out of the way. Start the day with dinner. And uh, oh, th th there's something to be said for that. Eggs are good for breakfast. Yeah. Eggs are, eggs are excellent. Yeah. There's a, a, that's why I love Spain. You know, I love the food in Spain because what I would have for breakfast, I would have all day. So my wife makes fried eggs. My wife who's Spanish makes fried eggs for dinner. And I'm like, yes, breakfast for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and she just looks at me funny. Like, what do you mean? We, we have this for dinner. This is normal. <laughs> it's like, no, it's breakfast. Where's the bacon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll keep that in mind. If you ever come visit. <laughs> Uh, fried eggs it is <laughs> i have them ready all okay. right well thank you so much uh you. when i have a i i'll call i'll hit you guys up when i have a final product or at least an alpha to test out mm -hmm. um yeah. hopefully things calm down and actually i can actually sit down and write some rules mm -hmm. that make sense that aren't scribbled in yeah. chicken scratch with my hands is there like a link of something uh, online? Have you put something online already? I, I have not because it's so terrible that I don't wish the, pub, the <laughs> world to see it. Oh, that's mm. fine. If you ever it's an uh, abomination. If you ever have a uh, like a Patreon page, we all so wait, uh, we had this whole conversation and it's actually bad. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right now it's it's bad, but it's going to be so amazing. Mm. Okay. Uh, everything everything starts off bad. Uh, nothing starts off amazing. Have you ever read uh, Domine's first um, stories? Yeah, they were. <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, they were really crap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Why? Well, I have. I think all the Witcher books now, uh, the Witch Hunter books. Uh, I well, there's only two so far. Um, but, all of yeah, them. Yeah. Well, like... well, I'm waiting for the third one to come out. <laughs> yeah, we're writing. We're writing. You better buy a bigger bookcase. Yeah, better buy a bigger bookcase. Yeah. That's right. Much is it a big? Is it going to be a big book? <laughs> and there's going to be a lot of 
a lot of them, right? Um, if our Patreon takes off, uh, then uh, <laughs> there might be many. Well, we do think it's going to be um, bigger than um, the Beast of the Western Wilds. The new it, it, story. Yeah, it's already. I mean, we're still writing the first draft, yeah. and um, we, we and promised... it's already almost the length of the of the Beast of the Western Wilds. So right. it's definitely going to be bigger. We promised our patrons a story of at least two hours long in March. Well, it's going to be. Yeah, it's gonna. It's, be, al it's already gonna four. It's already hours four hours now, and, <laughs> yeah. and we're still, you know, nowhere near uh, the end. So yeah, wow. But we're getting there, and we're right on. Time. I mean, it, that's just the writing. We still have to record it, and we still have to get the music and the sound effects and everything. So. That's the easy. Part. Well, I, I, I did want to when I finish this when I finish this product when I announce new uh, extensions, I was thinking of making like ads that would have like sound effects on the background and everything and then show the new books. And I, I have a, yeah. a, 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 I have a buddy of mine who does that. The, he, he can do all the visuals, but I have no one to do the audios. Okay, I yeah. say as I wink at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that sounds like a lot of fun. I would love to do that. Yeah, I actually did. I did do a, a voiceover for your school, right? Yes, you did it for our house system. It was very, it, everyone. I, I even made the music for that. Yeah, it was it was the best thing you could have done for the kids. The kids loved it. Yeah, Maybe you should nice. uh, t tell the the listeners about your house system because obviously yeah. they don't. So know. you got a oh. Harry Potter like school, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, like so kind of Hogwarts. At our school, uh, each student is put into uh, each student is put into a house, uh, which is sort of like a, a team. Uh, since our first grade, all the way till they stay in the same house until they graduate. And students get uh, points for, well, uh, virtuous behavior. Uh, and so, and those points go to their house as a team and the team, the house with the most points, they win at the end of the year. But the house also has its own internal culture and its, its own traditions. They, the students develop their traditions. They elect their leader and the leader creates events and everything. So it's, it's trying to give the students their own little, their own little club their own little community within the entire school. And so the videos, the histories, they're, well, they're made up histories, but they're very cool as if the houses have existed throughout history already. Wow. Uh, and the students, they, they love it. Well, at least the little ones, they love it a lot. High school students, they're, well, they're high school students. <laughs> nothing nothing yeah, impressive. They're probably just kind of cynical about everything, right? Yes, yeah. But they're supposed to be the leaders. So they, they kind of, they see the excitement in the little kids and they're like, well, maybe... Maybe it is fun. Yeah, I can imagine yeah, so. that. Super cool. Yeah, but there's there's so much there's so much more to do. So much for more mm -hmm. things to do with that. Right. Yeah. Okay. You could actually perhaps map all those Magic the Gathering colors onto the houses of your school, and <laughs> or not. That would we we would have five houses. We have four. We would have five houses. I could do that, but then who would want to be in the the, the black house of <laughs> yeah. Slytherin, right? Yeah. Selfishness and ambition, and <laughs> I guess everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Slytherin is clearly the best house. Everyone knows that. Is it? I don't know. It is. It is. I think it is. <laughs> I'm clearly a Slytherin. No I one knows person. anything about. <laughs> And no one knows anything yeah. about Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff. No one cares about those houses. No, no that's care true. About that. Yeah, that's true. But I, I think Ravenclaw. I mean, Hufflepuff. Is, there's nothing cool about that. But Ravenclaw. Yeah, that's. They they're like the. Cool. They're like the smart ones, right? They're. Yeah. And then the uh, Gry cool. Gryffindor are like the heroes or the noble-hearted. Yeah. The Slytherin are. They're well, like they're the ambitious. They're the ambitious ones. Um, but I don't know. I think they're cool. <laughs> I'm just everyone picks the oh, yeah. good guys. I like. I I find the bad guys so much more interesting. They have yeah. more complex stories. I don't, I, I don't think that's an unpopular opinion at all. No. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. And I, I mean, let's it's face it. It's difficult to write uh, an interesting bad guy. Um, definitely, it's. Uh, it's important too because if you're bad yeah. guys, just uh, I want to destroy the world, that's it, and it's kind of boring. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's uh, I sometimes I feel like I I I start to I come for the hero, but I stay for the villain. <laughs> yeah, I right. You you, you you like the hero, but then you find out who the villain is. You're like, oh, what are they gonna do with this guy? Yeah. How is the hero gonna react to this guy? What is this guy gonna do? Especially if they have their story arc, uh, can be very interesting. I, I yeah. think, like I think there there's a lack of. Um... There's a serious lack of awesome heroes. I mean, like, like I mean, it, I think it's natural that people gravitate towards the film, towards the villain. Um, yeah, like you just said, it's kind. Of, I think that's natural. Um, what's harder is to make a, a hero that's really appealing. Um, and yeah, I think there's kind of a lack of that. And I know I, I've I've been talking a bit too much about this, but. That's one of the strengths I feel of, of, of the Lord of the Rings is like, who is Sauron? Sauron is just this vague evil entity. But, you know, the whole story is about all of these people who are all, you know, various degrees of good <laughs> and all <laughs> trying, you know, to, to, to help, you know, to do their part in this. And... Um, and 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 you know they are the characters you find interesting, you know whether it's Aragorn or Gandalf or Frodo. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think that's rare uh, these days. It's true. It's quite rare. That that, that actually the, the the heroic characters are the ones that make you say, yeah, that guy's interesting, and and this person's cool, and I don't know. Or maybe I'm just full of crap. No, they might be. <laughs> no, no, you have a point. Maybe, maybe the big interest in my interest in villains is that people aren't writing or creating interesting heroes. Yeah, I guess it, you put it much more succinctly. Yeah, that's yeah. That's what I mean. The the villain is so interesting yeah. because he's complex and yeah. he's trying to yeah. do good, but the in the wrong way. Pussies. It's the like hero. you know, you've got <laughs> Joker. Joker was this really interesting movie. Disney's been doing a lot of you know. Let's revisit the villain and make them a bit more nuanced type movies. Um, not always as successfully, but I mean, there's clearly an, an audience for that. Um, but not enough people are, are, you know, doing work to make a really good character in, really interesting. When I think in, in, in actuality, good people are in actually much more interesting than bad people in reality. Well, when they have their when they have their conflicts and people tr and they try to overcome their conflicts, yeah, which is a, what good people do and bad people, yeah, do. exactly. You, you can have a hero with a, a sob story uh, yeah. in their past as well, but if you if you are if you act like a hero despite all these things, then you get less credit for that than if you're a villain and they they say like, oh, poor guy, he had a bad childhood. <laughs> yeah, I find I find the the. Um, like a good example of a, of, of a, I don't know if he's a hero yet because the series isn't done. Uh, I watched The Walking Dead and uh, there are a lot of very bad seasons, but uh, there's this character that is my favorite character, which is Negan. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen The Walking Dead. No, no, no I, I, oh. it's too violent for me. It's, it, oh. it seemed, I, yeah, it's, it's a little, it, that made me say, oh, I'm, I'm going to be. It's a, yes, and it's a <laughs> bit much. They, they yeah. use the violence a lot, but there's this, um, there is this character. His name is Negan, and he he um, you get more of his backstory. So basically, his story is he was a good, decent guy. Well, actually, no, he wasn't. He was a he was a bit of a mess of a guy. His wife makes he gets married and he gets a little bit better. His wife gets cancer and he becomes a good guy. And then his wife dies during the apocalypse, during the zombie apocalypse, and then he becomes sort of broken because of that. He leads later in like the present, he becomes a leader of a group that makes the protagonist's lives terrible. But it's not that he's just evil and he's doing evil for evil's sake. Is He is asserting dominance over territory and charging taxes. And when they don't pay their taxes or whatever these taxes are, which is food or people, mm -hmm. he punishes them. So he's the bad guy. He's punishing them for asserting his power over them. Um, he loses, they beat him, but they don't kill him. They put him in jail. And he sort of has this sort of transformation throughout the series. And I find it very interesting how, how he becomes, he's not a hero yet, 
but he's not a villain either. It's how he's changing as a human being. I find it Mm. so interesting because he was a good guy, then evil or the bad guy. And then he's becoming a good guy. And, and I find that transition of how he becomes from evil to good, really interesting. Mm. Yeah. Uh, He's the only reason I'm still watching The Walking Dead. I just love Negan. It's what we we recently talked about that we wanted to do an episode on villains. And right. that, that's the interesting thing, like a, a villain becoming a hero or heroes yeah. becoming villains. Yeah, that like story the, the whole redemption arc uh, phenomenon. Yeah, I love it. I'm a big fan of that, that whole... Uh, the whole every oh, maybe we should have you have you yeah, on again same. as a guest <laughs> <laughs> no i'm no professional in that area i just <laughs> i just a big oh, fan of we're no professionals on any of the topics we talk about <laughs> uh, it's just fun right? i mean it's just uh two people talking about their views and and experiences yeah. when it comes to storytelling and of course focused on 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 you know the fantas- fantastic uh type of storytelling yeah. Well, I, I have to I have to go. I have to go out yeah, to me too. take care of my kids. You have to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. This was yes, that's definitely a, a that's great important. discussion. Morality. Yeah, it was. It, it really was. Really an interesting topic, uh, topic in storytelling. So really great to have you on. Well, th- I hope next time we if we do this, if there is a next time, if I get invited ever again, they're ruining your podcast. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, uh, I would love to do it in person over a beer. That would be, that would be, that would be great. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. I'll have one ready for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Thank great, you so uh, much. Great day. You too. Thank Bye. you. Bye.